Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic and the pre-decision wrap-up of the class action 12711 DCS in the Delaware Court of Chancery against Elon Musk, known now as the Solar City Bailout Trial. We're going to provide an in-depth summary of this series using this document, the plaintiff's post-trial brief that was presented to the court in January of 2022, six months after the July 2021 trial wrapped up. An uncommon procedure, Vice Chancellor Slice ordered this summary of the trial from both parties. For this episode, we are not even going to add any color commentary. This material will speak for itself, and it's taken straight from the plaintiff's post-trial arguments. This document is an 80-page summary, not including the two pages of table of contents and five pages of authority. It includes information from witnesses whose testimony we have broken down and other witnesses we have not referred to yet. Each of the numbered pages has footnotes identifying which exhibit or authority is being referred to in the text above it on the page. There are 403 such notations identifying exactly how each argument is supported. So on the body pages, this area of the page is what the plaintiff's lawyers can prove, and this area is how they can prove it using the evidence and testimony provided. Due to the length of the document, we are going to render a Reader's Digest version. Important parts will be read verbatim. Other portions will be truncated with only the highlights being read out. That being said, to begin with, the preliminary statement starting on page 1 will be read verbatim. Trial proved key and irrefutable facts. First, Musk was a conflicted fiduciary standing on both sides of the acquisition. He is required, as the proponent of the challenged transaction, to prove entire fairness. Entire fairness also applies because 1. A majority of the board was not disinterested and or independent, and 2. Musk controlled Tesla and the acquisition. Second, Musk claim that he was fully recused was false. Musk, 1. Initiated the acquisition with his cousin Lyndon Rive without board knowledge. 2. Co-opted Tesla's senior management, outside counsel, and financial advisors. 3. Accelerated diligence and negotiations to sign the deal before SolarCity announced disastrous second quarter 2016 financial results and or tripped its liquidity covenant. And 4. Convinced skeptical stockholders to approve the bailout of SolarCity by lying about the solar roof. But for Musk, Tesla would not have bought SolarCity at all, let alone at a premium price. Third, Musk hid critical information about SolarCity's value. Musk did not disclose that SolarCity was insolvent, could not pay its bills or employees on time without breaching debt covenants, could not raise equity, and had no viable solution to a liquidity crisis that began in 2015. Since at least the first quarter of 2016, Musk knew but failed to disclose that SolarCity needed the acquisition to survive. Fourth, Musk harmed Tesla. Musk pushed the acquisition when Tesla was debt-laden, selling equity to satisfy its own capital needs, facing manufacturing hell with Model X, and poised to bet the company on a Model 3 roll-up. Tesla ultimately paid $2.6 billion for an insolvent SolarCity and assumed SolarCity's $3.4 billion in debt. It, Tesla, injected $300 million to maintain operations and paid off $500 million in short-term debt. Musk then dismantled SolarCity's operations and joint ventured with SolarCity competitors to install Tesla batteries. The acquisition was wasteful. Musk did not, and cannot, demonstrate that the acquisition was entirely fair. There were no mechanisms like a special committee in place to protect Tesla from Musk conflicts, and he did not refute the impact his undisclosed role had on both the process and the price. He did not rebut evidence demonstrating SolarCity's insolvency, and his expert conceded that Evercore did not appropriately adjust SolarCity's financial projections to account for the SITC phase-out. Musk's only fair price argument is that SolarCity's stock price justified the premium Tesla paid, but Tesla's and SolarCity's advisors admitted that SolarCity's stock price did not reflect undisclosed material information. Acquisition leaks in March and Tesla's initial offer in June inflated SolarCity's stock price, and even if SolarCity's stock price were a reliable indicator of value, Musk can only rationalize the acquisition price by assuming $800 plus million in synergies, an amount unsupported by any contemporaneous evidence. Given Musk's disloyalty, the court has wide discretion to fashion an equitable remedy. The court could award damages of between $1.4 to $2.4 billion, which range is derived from the price Tesla paid, less SolarCity's liquidation value reflecting its insolvency, and going concern value under a number of accepted valuation methodologies. The court could also fashion an equitable remedy based on principles of restitution, unjust enrichment, rescission, and recissory damages. 
The 2.4 million Tesla shares Musk received in the acquisition are currently worth $9.4 billion. The court could require Musk to return some or all of the enormous gain he has realized as a result of receiving excessive Tesla shares, either by returning the excess shares or paying Tesla the monetary value of those shares at the time of the judgment. Moving into the statement of facts, Solar City's debt fueled growth and rapid decline. Solar City relies on debt to grow aggressively. In 2006, Musk and his cousins founded Solar City. Musk provided the money and was chairman and the largest stockholder, owning 21.9% of his outstanding shares at the time of the acquisition. From inception, Solar City embarked on a risky and aggressive business model. Solar City marketed, sold, and installed rooftop solar energy systems to residential homeowners, principally through no money down transactions. Solar City fronted the majority of the installation costs, then refinanced those installations through complex asset backed securitizations. Solar City never generated positive cash flows and incurred massive operating losses every year. During the five years preceding the acquisition, Solar City reported $2.2 billion in net losses, which increased significantly year over year and culminated in $820 million in net losses in 2016. Solar City therefore relied on debt markets to grow. Solar City aggressively monetized contracted for customer payments and tax credits (SITCs) to generate cash from its installations. Solar City sold corporate bonds, termed solar bonds, principally to Musk and SpaceX. By the time of Tesla's initial offer, Solar City owed $375 million on its revolver, $217 million in bonds, $909 million in convertible debt, and an additional $21 million in other recourse debt, much of which was due in 2017. Solar City never developed a sustainable long-term growth plan to reduce its dependence on debt. In 2014, Musk asked Bus to join Solar City as CFO to clean up material weaknesses in Solar City's financial accounting following a restatement. Bus needed to build some staff and some teams to help them just really manage the long-term growth. By 2016, Bus still believed Solar City's management was horrible and overly optimistic in creating projections. As Bilicek testified when Lazard was engaged on the acquisition, Solar City management was unable to say at the beginning of the day what the cash position of the company was, which is not even close to being best practices for a real company. Solar City attempted to vertically integrate by acquiring solar cell manufacturer Solivo in September of 2014. The acquisition was a disaster. Solivo had no experience with high volume manufacturing and Solar City's technological and manufacturing experience was non-existent. Solar City contracted with the state of New York to manufacture solar panels at a to-be-built factory in Buffalo. The contract required Solar City to meet certain build-out, production, and employment milestones that would require significant and unavailable capital. If Solar City failed, it would face tens of millions of dollars in penalties. By 2015, Solar City was spending substantial amounts to build Solivo's factories. Solar City's troubles accelerate. By mid-2015, Solar City was overextended with lower-than-expected installations, a broken sales department, massive capex outlays for Solivo, and debt maturities it could not repay. By the fall, management believed it had a major liquidity crisis. On September 20, 2015, Solar City's COO, Sarah, informed the executive management team that Solar City's total war chest of available cash, which was $1.1 billion in January of 2015, would be only $200 million by year-end. Rive immediately instituted weekly cash meetings. On September 29, 2015, Solar City's senior vice president, finance and analysis, informed superiors that the situation was worse than expected. Solar City needed to maintain an average monthly cash balance of approximately $116 million to remain compliant with this revolving debt facility's liquidity covenant. Management projected that cash would drop to $35 million by the week of November 20th. A breach would trigger an incurable default on Solar City's revolver and cross defaults on other debt. On October 15, 2015, Bus and Rive told Solar City's board, including Musk and Gracias, that Solar City needed 180 to 300 million in additional cash. Solar City management also reported that 2015 installations were expected to be 920 megawatts versus budget of 1.05 gigawatts, reducing cash inflow. On October 21, 2015, following a weekly cash meeting, Solar City management confirmed that updated forecast projects our December monthly average balance at $91 million, which is $24 million below our revolver covenant threshold of $115 million. Solar City immediately sought cash through an equity or convertible bond offering, public or private. Solar City's investment banks advised that neither was viable. 
Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse, both of which underwrote SolarCity's IPO, advised SolarCity against conducting any type of seasoned equity offering SEO. Meanwhile, private equity investors had no interest in acquiring SolarCity equity. They would consider only very high coupon debt, which would possibly violate SolarCity's debt covenants. In November of 2015, SolarCity secured limited funding from Silver Lake. This cash was insufficient, as conditions in the company's performance and its balance sheet deteriorated incredibly rapidly from the fourth quarter of 2015 through the second quarter of 2016. In late 2015, macroeconomic headwinds exacerbated SolarCity's liquidity problems. Changes in net metering laws threatened SolarCity's ability to operate in certain markets. SITCs were set to expire and Congress had yet to extend them. SunEdison, the market leader in large-scale renewable energy projects, was descending into bankruptcy. SunEdison, like SolarCity, funded growth through debt and refinancing renewable energy projects. By September of 2015, SunEdison announced it was laying off 1,000 employees. The market learned that SunEdison was not sufficiently capitalized to sustain its aggressive growth. SunEdison filed for bankruptcy on April 20, 2016. SunEdison's collapse created an issue across the board for solar companies. Lenders increased scrutiny of issuers. Asset-backed refinancing deals took longer to close. Both developments were especially problematic for SolarCity because it had declining credit worthiness, was already operating close to its liquidity covenant, and needed hundreds of millions of dollars to pay its short-term debts and meet its Salivo commitments. SolarCity sells its golden eggs. By the end of 2015, SolarCity recognized that it could not continue business as usual. Sarah developed a four-year plan, presented to SolarCity executives in December. In Sarah's view, SolarCity's retained equity interest in cash flows from installed systems was a cache of golden eggs, and SolarCity was the goose that lays golden eggs. He believed wrongly that SolarCity could sell its retained equity interest in existing, already financed solar installations to build new installations. Sarah's plan could not and did not solve the liquidity crisis. As plaintiff's expert Jürgen Mosner explained, the remaining equity interests that SolarCity held in the VIEs were not as valuable as perceived or claimed. SolarCity calculated a net present value of its retained equity interest at $2.2 billion using a 6% discount rate and assuming 100% contract renewals. Each of the three cash equity deals SolarCity conducted in 2016, however, had marginal interest rates between 11% and 12% meaning SolarCity's 6% discount rate was far too low, as reflected by a massive stock price drop when each was disclosed. Further, the assumption that 100% of SolarCity's customers would renew their contracts at the end of their 20-year terms was unreasonable, in light of the declining cost of solar systems, system degradation, and increased consumer choice. More fundamentally, SolarCity did not have the cash it needed to sustain the growth and produce new volume in line with their four-year plan. As Rive testified by the first quarter of 2016, SolarCity's board decided to shift focus to cash sales, begin layoffs, and push out payables to vendors. These actions reduced deployments, i.e. growth, and would ultimately preclude the volume necessary to achieve Sarah's impossible four-year plan. Meanwhile, SolarCity's lenders were concerned about declining credit worthiness and insolvency risk. In early 2016, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, one of the primary regulators of SolarCity's bank lenders, downgraded SolarCity's credit rating. In February of 2016, Citibank decreased a tax equity fund commitment from $100 million to $20 million because of decreased interest in tax equity and lender consent issues. In March 2016, U.S. Bank decreased a tax equity fund commitment from $140 million to $50 million due to SolarCity's credit issues. On March 31, 2016, Credit Suisse closed a back leverage transaction with SolarCity on onerous terms, citing concerns about SolarCity's ability to fulfill its deployment guidance. In total, in the first quarter of 2016, SolarCity was able to secure only $305 million of the $940 million in tax equity financing it originally projected. SolarCity's stock price dropped precipitously in the first quarter of 2016, making an SEO even less likely to succeed. Musk uses his control to bail out SolarCity. Musk starts the acquisition. As Musk testified, SolarCity needed to raise cash or be acquired, one of the two. With the former option not viable, Musk told Rive that Tesla would buy SolarCity. Musk knew about SolarCity's rapidly deteriorating financial condition. During a February 2, 2016 SolarCity board meeting, Musk received a presentation on SolarCity's 2016 liquidity by month. This analysis shows significant liquidity concerns, including the likelihood of SolarCity violating its debt covenants. 
This analysis showed significant liquidity concerns, including the likelihood of SolarCity violating its debt covenants. SolarCity forecasted that its cash balances would drop below the liquidity covenants threshold in May, August, and September of 2016. SolarCity's directors also discussed management's forecast of over $200 million negative net cash flows for 2016, meaning that cash from operations could not solve its shortfall. Two days later, RAV convened an emergency cash planning meeting with Musk and SolarCity management to discuss how we are going to manage our cash need. RAV and Musk discussed taking extreme measures to conserve cash. SolarCity started withholding vendor payments and ranking accounts payable to decide which it could pay. Management developed finance postponed guidelines to suspend specific installations based on their cash impact because installations were cash flow negative. Following this meeting, Musk called Rive and told him that Tesla would buy SolarCity. The timing was bad for Tesla. The following month, Tesla was set to unveil the Model 3, which Tesla described as the biggest consumer product launch ever. Musk testified the Model 3 was a bet the company product. Musk told the market that Tesla would reach its 500,000 total unit build plan by 2018, which would require additional capital. Tesla needed $4 billion for Model 3 CapEx, was forecasting that its cash balances would drop to a deficit in 2017, and had to conduct its own SEO. On February 27, 2016, Musk called Tesla's CFO, Jason Wheeler, and directed him to prepare a financial analysis of a SolarCity acquisition for a special board meeting two days later. There was only one agenda item at that meeting, buying Solar City. Before the meeting, Musk arranged for Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, which had historically represented both companies, to waive conflicts and attend the board meeting. Wheeler's analysis showed that the acquisition would be highly dilutive under all cases. During the meeting, no director asked Musk why it was so urgent that Tesla acquire Solar City. Contrary to the proxy, the Tesla board did not reject Musk's proposal. Rather, it told Musk that it was not a good time for Tesla but nonetheless authorized management to gather additional details and to further explore and analyze a transaction with SolarCity. Despite the small number of people aware of Musk's sudden interest in acquiring SolarCity, beginning around March 2, 2016, investment websites and newspapers reported the potential transaction, causing SolarCity's stock price to rise nearly 25% from 1801 on March 1 to 2249 on March 3. Beach found that this increase was highly statistically significant. No other information could explain the increase except for the leaks, and SolarCity's stock price continued to be affected through June. On March 15, 2016, Musk again raised acquiring SolarCity. The board again asked Musk to focus on making cars, reiterating that this is something that we should postpone to a later date. The proxy did not disclose this meeting. Notwithstanding the board's direction, Musk, Gracias, and Marin interviewed potential deal counsel on March 25, 2016, and selected Wachtell Lipton to represent Tesla in negotiations with SolarCity. Musk's and Gracias' involvement in selecting Tesla's counsel was not disclosed in the proxy. SolarCity's problems worsen and it hides its true financial condition from stockholders. Following the first quarter of 2016, SolarCity's liquidity crisis deepened, and demand for its systems continued to decline. With $32 million in net negative cash flow in the first quarter, SolarCity projected over $139 million in additional negative cash flow for the second quarter and over $103 million in total negative cash flow for fiscal year 2016. By April, SolarCity management acknowledged that the company had no room for error. At an April 26, 2016 SolarCity board meeting, which Musk attended, Rive addressed important, disturbing issues concerning SolarCity's outlook and financial viability. Rive proffered lowered guidance. SolarCity expected installations of only 900 megawatts for 2016, 28% fewer than the 1250 megawatt guidance he provided Musk just two months earlier. Rive also warned that May, August are at risk of tripping the Revolver Covenant and presented an updated 2016 liquidity by month that showed intramonth cash balances dropping to $73 million and remaining below the liquidity covenant through October of 2016. SolarCity's Form 10-Q for the first quarter of 2016 failed to disclose this information and falsely claimed that SolarCity would have sufficient cash to meet cash requirements for the next 12 months. Further, management lowered guidance only to a range of 1,000 to 1,100 megawatts rather than the 900 to 1,000 megawatt range in management's 2016 reforecast. Even without full information, SolarCity's stock price cratered with an excess negative return of 17.4% relative to its peers. In May 2016, with installations dropping, 
Solar City Management privately acknowledged that its sales division was badly, badly broken. Internal booking reports were drenched in a sea of red, and opportunity creation was trending down. Solar City was fighting turnover and morale problems among its sales staff and was exposed and vulnerable to losing its top sales talent. Solar City was further struggling with its cost of acquisition and sales efficiency due to a bloated sales organization. Meanwhile, Solar City was still not raising the cash it projected through its refinancing operations. In the first quarter of 2016, Bank of America, one of Solar City's largest tax equity lenders, began pushing for significantly more insight into Solar City's corporate financial situation. Solar City was only able to close two tax equity transactions during the second quarter, the largest, a reduced $80 million commitment by Bank of America, CAS 3. Together, the two funds brought in just $95 million of the $420 million of tax equity financing Solar City originally projected. According to Rive, CAST 3 was the worst fund in the market, and Solar City closed it only because of the situation we were in at the time. Even with CAST 3, Solar City reported only $145.7 million in cash and cash equivalents as of June 30, 2016, less than $30 million above the liquidity covenant. Musk pushes the Tesla board to offer a premium price. Musk and Rive again spoke privately about the acquisition in May of 2016. Solar City was moving May's expenses into June, including payroll, accounts payable, and Salivo expenses to remain afloat. Rive wanted to proceed with the acquisition immediately, but Musk had to push it out to June. Musk, however, knew that Solar City faced an immediate cash deficit and could not survive through the acquisition process without a bridge loan, which Musk promised Rive Tesla would provide. On May 31, 2016, Musk again brought the Solar City acquisition to the board. Despite the proxy suggestion that the board discussed opportunities in the solar energy space generally, Solar City was the only acquisition target Musk discussed. The board authorized Musk and his management team to engage an independent financial advisor on behalf of the board and the company. By the May 31, 2016 board meeting, Musk already retained Wachtell to serve as legal counsel to buy, exclusively, Solar City. Just over two weeks later, Musk called another special meeting of the board. Prior to that meeting, he personally helped prepare an offer letter to Solar City and a blog post announcing the offer, and requested and received a draft presentation from Evercore to review and provide comment. At the meeting, Musk actively participated in the board's pricing and strategy discussions. He discussed Tesla's specific offer price, negotiating tactics, and walkaway price. Evercore recommended a $25 to $27 per share offer. Musk advocated for a $28.50 offer, reflecting a 30% premium to Solar City's market price. Musk explained that the price had to be publicly defensible for Solar City. Thus, contrary to the proxy, the full Tesla board, including Musk and Grisias, discussed and resolved to propose the specific exchange ratio of 0.122x to 0.131x, 2650 to 2850 per Solar City share. Before the initial offer, Musk never told the board that Solar City needed to raise money or be acquired. He already told Rive that Tesla would acquire Solar City and give it bridge financing. Or Solar City was cash strapped and at risk of tripping its liquidity covenant. Rather, after the board settled at a range Musk approved, Musk just left the room so that the remaining directors could vote. Immediately after the June 20 meeting, Tesla made the initial offer, which was publicly disclosed after the market closed on June 21, 2016. Following the announcement, Tesla's stock price plummeted by more than 10%, wiping out $3.07 billion of value, greater than SolarCity's entire market capitalization. On June 22, 2016, Musk hosted a teleconference with analysts to discuss the initial offer. Knowing the true condition of SolarCity, he nonetheless stated, the board opinion is unanimous for both companies. So I mean, unless there's something discovered that like, that I have no idea about, the independent board members would recommend in favor of completing a transaction somewhere in the price range that was mentioned. Solar City's Downward Spiral Only three days after the initial offer, Bank of America further downgraded Solar City's risk rating, citing, among other things, Solar City's third consecutive quarter of negative AB cash flow, beginning with Q315. Recent delayed or missed closings of cash equity and tax equity transactions, which contributed to declining operational liquidity, significant $30 million per quarter cash outflow for Salivo Manufacturing, and Solar City's consistent track record of missing plan due to the timing of contract monetization, overspending in SGNA, management turnover in the finance department, and difficulty in forecasting performance. 
One week later, SolarCity ended the second quarter with over $216 million in negative cash flow. SolarCity's filings for the second quarter of 2016 falsely blamed Tesla's June 20, 2016 initial offer for some delays in obtaining financing and entering into new financing arrangements and its low cash balances. Those delays, however, began before the initial offer and resulted directly from undisclosed lender concerns about SolarCity's creditworthiness and liquidity. On June 25, 2016, SolarCity's special committee retained Lazard as a financial advisor. Lazard quickly confirmed that SolarCity was on the brink of a liquidity event. On July 9, 2016, Lazard presented an analysis showing that SolarCity's intermonth cash balances would dip well below the balance required by the liquidity covenant numerous times over the following months. Lazard expressly advised that SolarCity was close to breaching a liquidity covenant under the company's revolving credit facility and would be operating with little margin for error until October 2016. Lazard was concerned about the company on a standalone basis going forward. Musk drives the transaction to signing. Musk continued to negotiate with SolarCity outside the board process. Rive regularly provided Musk with updates on SolarCity's worsening cash position and need for bridge financing. On July 9, 2016, Rive and Musk discussed SolarCity's liquidity needs and the acquisition. Rive reminded Musk that SolarCity was running crazy close to its liquidity covenant and he was really afraid of the domino effect that would result if SolarCity did not get cash soon. The next day, Rive emailed Musk the cash forecast he gave the board in April and again warned of the domino effect that SolarCity faced due to its liquidity issues. Rive copied SolarCity's in-house counsel to keep his exchange with Musk privileged, further asking Musk to speak over the phone regarding SolarCity's $200 million bridge loan request. The proxy does not disclose these communications. Musk decided against Tesla providing a bridge loan and began exploring whether Tesla could buy Solevo assets as an alternative way to get SolarCity the cash it needed. On or around July 14th, Musk relayed these thoughts to Rive. On the same date, Musk spoke with SolarCity Special Committee member Don Kendall. Though the proxy acknowledges that Kendall and Musk discussed certain aspects of the deal, including the go shop period and breakup fee, it omits other significant discussion topics, including Tesla's potential acquisition of Solevo, SolarCity's reverse due diligence on Tesla, SolarCity's interim operating covenants, and the offer price of the Tesla proposal. Musk pushes to execute quickly. On July 13, 2016, Evercore discovered SolarCity's multiple potential breaches of its liquidity covenant. Two days later, Evercore had a very concerning call with Lazard, where Lazard made it appear that it was unaware of the potential covenant breaches. McBean immediately telephoned Musk. Musk was surprised that Lazard didn't know that SolarCity could potentially default on its revolver. Musk did not appear surprised about the liquidity problems, but he was very concerned about the pace of diligence. Within an hour of that call, Musk set up daily calls with Tesla's advisors and management to expedite the process. Musk did not tell his board about these daily calls, and the proxy omits them. The first daily call took place the following morning and addressed the status of every of all the work streams. Musk and the deal team discussed Evercore's financial model and valuation fairness opinion, interim bridge financing for SolarCity, and board review and approval of the transaction. Musk then directed the team to get the deal signed immediately. Fewer than 30 minutes after the start of the first daily call, McBean emailed her team, We are running out of time. Plan is to sign this week and fairness is on Monday. Musk's accelerated timetable served only SolarCity's interest. Evercore nonetheless did its best to make Musk's timetable work. Over the next 48 hours, Evercore created its own downside case projections. The bankers revised assumptions and inputs until they arrived at a DCF valuation that could justify a price within the initial offer range. Even then, on July 18, 2016, Evercore's Fairness Committee rejected that range. Later that day, Evercore sent Wheeler the same downside case it shared with its Fairness Committee. An hour later, Evercore called Musk for another update. After talking with Musk, Evercore's downside projections doubled overnight. The net effect of Evercore's changing assumptions moved the midpoint of Evercore's DCF range from $20 to $34.50. At the next board meeting on July 19th, Evercore disclosed SolarCity's dire liquidity situation. Evercore explained that SolarCity would likely trip its liquidity covenant by July 30th, 2016, triggering an incurable default across all of SolarCity's debt. Evercore further warned that disclosure of an event of default would threaten SolarCity's ability to maintain solvency. Evercore further detailed SolarCity's significant upcoming expenses in connection with Solevo. 
Evercore observed that the board was particularly concerned about the issues presented at that board meeting. The day after his fellow directors learned SolarCity was likely insolvent, Musk self-published his master plan part 2 without seeking board approval. He unilaterally went directly to stockholders to explain that his and purportedly Tesla's vision for the future could not be achieved without the acquisition of SolarCity. On July 21st, before approaching the board, Evercore had a private meeting with Musk to discuss his recommendation that Tesla lower its offer. As McBean testified, we have to update Elon before talking to the board. Evercore provided its recommendation to the board the following day. Evercore's call with Musk was not disclosed to the stockholders or the board. On July 22nd, SolarCity informed Evercore that it would be delaying certain expenses for Solivo until the first quarter of 2017, making them Tesla's responsibility and putting Tesla at risk of paying penalties. Evercore did not revise its projections to account for this information. On July 24, the full board met to discuss the transaction and the revised offer. Among other things, the board discussed whether to make a revised offer before the release of SolarCity's second quarter 2016 results and reduced installation guidance. The board was aware that the market would not react favorably to the results. The board was likewise aware that SolarCity had limited options for raising capital without a Tesla deal. Musk, however, reiterated his belief in the strategic rationale of the transaction and suggested the board should move forward with the deal. The proxy falsely stated that the board resolved to make a revised offer at that meeting. Rather, the board convened a second, undisclosed telephonic meeting with Musk without outside advisors later that evening. As Dan Holm admitted, the board called Musk to discuss if it could be a better strategy to actually acquire just the Salivo assets as opposed to the entire company if we couldn't get to a negotiated agreement around the entire company in order to fulfill Tesla's mission. Musk said no. The board proceeded with a revised offer of 0.105 per SolarCity share. After all, Tesla's acquisition of just Salivo would not save SolarCity. On July 30, the board offered to pay 0.110 shares of Tesla stock for each share of SolarCity stock. Tesla advised stockholders that this exchange ratio represented an equity value for SolarCity of approximately $2.6 billion, or $25.37 per share, based on the 5-day volume weighted average price of Tesla stock. SolarCity narrowly avoids default between signing and closing. By August 7, 2016, SolarCity had over $86 million overdue in accounts payable, had delayed payroll for its own employees, was unable to cover its debts or operating expenses, and was incapable of finding financing independently of Musk. SolarCity failed Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's credit approval, and Silver Lake, which insisted on a 44% effective interest rate for convertible bonds, could not syndicate the paper quickly enough. By August 23, Musk and his cousins purchased $100 million of 12-month 6.5% solar bonds. This was the only bridge financing SolarCity could arrange. Musk manipulates the stockholder vote. By mid-September 2016, the latest feedback from major investors was very negative on SolarCity. Musk told Bus that three things were necessary to change the tide, including that SolarCity would need to solve its liquidity crisis and stockholders would need a joint product demo of the solar roof. Musk could not solve SolarCity's liquidity crisis before the stockholder vote. As Wheeler informed Musk on October 7, 2016, Tesla needed to provide a $500 million capital infusion into SolarCity to de-lever and de-risk the credit profile. And on June 20, 2016, SolarCity had massive capex needs that required over $2 billion in financing every year for the foreseeable future. Musk instead focused on selling his integrated product solution to stockholders. Musk accelerated the product launch for the solar roof to occur before the stockholder vote. SolarCity had no budget for this product, which was just conceptual in nature. The tiles on display did not work, but were for demonstration of the aesthetics. Days after the product launch, Musk tweeted, First solar roof deployments will start next summer. Then on November 17, 2016, at the shareholder vote, Musk assured investors, We expect to start doing the solar roofs in volume somewhere next year. At trial, Musk admitted that in 2016, Tesla did not have a viable plan to begin installing solar roofs in 2017 and that his assertions to the contrary were false. Tesla's public stockholders approved the acquisition on the same day. Ernst & Young confirms that SolarCity was insolvent. After the acquisition closed, SolarCity's auditors determined that SolarCity was insolvent. 
In January of 2017, E&Y discovered that SolarCity's projections prepared in August of 2016 did not include two payments related to solar bonds, SpaceX, as they were expecting a reinvestment. SolarCity also excluded payments of the corporate revolver, which will also be due in fiscal year 2017. E&Y concluded that SolarCity was short of cash by $169 million, of which, if you take out SpaceX, they are barely at break-even. Thus, E&Y's going concern analysis concluded that, as a standalone entity, SolarCity will not have sufficient cash to meet its obligations as they come due. To avoid this formal finding of insolvency, Tesla signed an equity confirmation letter on March 1, 2017 committing to pay down debt and make capital contributions to SolarCity for at least 12 months to support SolarCity's ongoing operations. Tesla shuts down SolarCity's operations. Facing significant production issues on the Model 3, Tesla's own cash burn and the difficulties of continuing SolarCity's growth, Musk dismantled SolarCity. By the end of 2016, SolarCity terminated 4,163 employees, including its installation workforce. Musk further eliminated SolarCity's main sales channels, including big box retailers and door-to-door -door sales. Musk purportedly redeployed SolarCity's remaining workforce to the Model 3. Each of these decisions further curtailed SolarCity's deployments and growth. Indeed, since the acquisition closed, SolarCity's deployments have continued to plummet. Musk also abandoned SolarCity's attempt at vertical integration. He negotiated a joint venture with Panasonic so that Panasonic, not Solevo, would manufacture Tesla solar cells in Buffalo. Tesla still does not produce any of the main components of a PV system, instead purchasing them from other manufacturers. Tesla also continues to rely on SolarCity's competitors to sell and install Tesla Powerwalls. Moving into the arguments section. Musk breached his fiduciary duties. Musk's conduct, largely undisclosed to Tesla stockholders or his fellow directors, receives no protection under the business judgment rule and constitutes a breach of his fiduciary duties to Tesla. Musk had a personal and individual interest in saving SolarCity. He elevated his personal concerns over Tesla's interests. He withheld critical information from the board and stockholders about his reasons for the acquisition and SolarCity's true financial condition. His machinations ultimately caused Tesla to buy an insolvent company. Among other things, Musk, upon learning that SolarCity was going to violate its liquidity covenant, began merger negotiations with Rive without board knowledge or approval, ignored his board's repeated direction to focus on Tesla's manufacturing and production problems to push the acquisition on Tesla, interviewed and hired deal counsel for the board without board knowledge or approval, pushed up the price of the initial offer so that it was publicly defensible to SolarCity stockholders reminding everyone in the room, I don't negotiate, engaged in undisclosed, substantive negotiations with Rive and Kendall to ensure SolarCity would survive until closing, accelerated the process and the pace of due diligence to serve SolarCity's timing needs and avoid a covenant breach, met with Evercore on numerous occasions including on daily calls with his deal team and on private calls to discuss price recommendations, and lied repeatedly to shareholders and this court about his role, the reason he had Tesla pursue the acquisition, and the benefits of the acquisition to Tesla. In short, Musk was the but-for cause of a transaction that Tesla did not need and could not afford. Entire fairness applies. The burden is on Musk to prove entire fairness. Entire fairness applies when 1. A corporate fiduciary stands on both sides of a transaction. 2. A majority of the board was not disinterested and independent. Or 3. The transaction involved a conflicted controlling stockholder. Here, each is true. Musk stood on both sides of the acquisition. When corporate fiduciaries stand on both sides of a challenge transaction, an instance where the director's loyalty has been called into question, the burden shifts to the fiduciaries to demonstrate the entire fairness of the transaction. There is no safe harbor for such divided loyalties in Delaware. Accordingly, directors with a conflict of interest relating to a proposed transaction should totally abstain from participating in the board's consideration of that transaction. Simply abstaining from votes is not enough. Musk stood on both sides of the acquisition. He was the largest stockholder of both Tesla and SolarCity and simultaneously served as Tesla's CEO and both companies' chairman. Musk, his cousins, and SpaceX collectively held $278 million of SolarCity debt, which would have been a total loss if SolarCity failed. As a SolarCity director, he would be subject to claims and potential liability. A failure of one of his pyramid of visionary companies would tarnish his reputation and raise questions about the viability of his other ventures. 
Musk admitted that he was not recused from all discussions concerning the acquisition and had to voice his opinion, obviously. In the Tesla boardroom, he negotiated for a higher initial offer than Evercore advised because it had to be publicly defensible to Solar City stockholders. He was also intimately involved in the entire process. Accordingly, Musk has the burden of proving entire fairness. The Tesla board was not disinterested and independent. Entire fairness applies also because the board labored under actual conflicts of interest, and there were not enough independent and disinterested individuals among the directors making the challenge decision to comprise a majority. At least four of the board's seven members were interested in the transaction or otherwise not independent of Musk. Elon Musk, Kimball Musk, and Gracias were unquestionably conflicted. Elon Musk and Gracias were directors of both Tesla and Solar City, and both admitted to their conflicts in connection with the acquisition. Kimball is Elon's brother and serves on the board to protect Elon's interests. He was also a Solar City stockholder and has significant margin loans on his Solar City shares. Jervidson was directly financially interested in Solar City. He was a managing director of DFJ, Solar City's third largest institutional stockholder, holding 4,827,000 shares. Jervison had a personal financial interest in Solar City that far exceeded his interest in Tesla. Jervison's partner, John Fisher, was on the Solar City board and could be subject to claims and potential liability if Solar City failed. Jervison had a financial interest in every DFJ fund and would be adversely affected by Solar City's collapse. Jervison was also a SpaceX director and owned 7,008,576 shares of SpaceX stock. As a holder of $165 million of Solar City debt, SpaceX would be adversely affected if Solar City defaulted. Jurvetson would not cross Musk or let Solar City fail. Aaron Priest was also interested in saving Solar City. Aaron Priest is co-founder and co-managing partner of DBL, a venture capital fund he started with Nancy Fund, to pursue impact investing. DBL Equity Fund, BAEF2 LP, held 928,977 shares of Solar City common stock at the time of the acquisition, making it one of Solar City's 10 largest investors. Fund served on the Solar City board and special committee and could be subject to claims and potential liability if Solar City failed. DBL also invested a total of $166 million in SpaceX, and Aaron Priest personally held 254,713 shares of SpaceX stock at the time of the acquisition. DBL's promotional materials identify Tesla, SolarCity, and SpaceX as DBL portfolio companies, identify Musk and Lyndon Rive as advisors to DBL, and assert that Musk companies demonstrate the value of DBL's impacting investing strategy. Aaron Priest appreciates that Musk had a significant influence on his professional career and that his continued status as a Tesla director has been a real benefit in fundraising. He could not cross Musk or let SolarCity fail. In addition to these five Tesla directors, Bus was not independent at the time the board started to consider the Solar City deal due to his ongoing professional relationship with Solar City. Bus had made generational wealth working with and for Musk, who personally recruited him to join the board in 2009 and Solar City in 2014. At the time the board was considering the acquisition, approximately 45% of Bus's wealth was attributable to his relationship with Musk and his companies. Because the board did not have a majority of disinterested or independent directors, entire fairness applies. Musk was a conflicted controller. A minority block holder is a controlling stockholder when he possesses a combination of potent voting power and management control such that the stockholder could be deemed to have effective control of the board without actually owning a majority of stock. The requisite degree of control can be shown to exist generally or with regard to the particular transaction that is being challenged. Here, plaintiffs proved both types of control. Plaintiffs established Musk's general control. He was and remains the driving force behind Tesla and the board decision making. Musk confirmed that he starts companies including Tesla and SolarCity to ensure his autonomy and authority, stating, I have to have my own company, otherwise somebody makes me do something I don't want to do. Musk was Tesla's CEO, chairman, and largest stockholder at the time of the acquisition. The board is filled with Musk's relatives, friends, and closest investors. A majority of Tesla directors, individually or through their investment funds, have invested in each of Musk's pyramid of companies, Tesla, SolarCity, and SpaceX. Musk authored Tesla's Master Plan in 2016 and Master Plan Part 2 in the midst of acquisition discussions and is known as a nanomanager. Analysts recognize Musk's dominance of Tesla, saying he is synonymous with Tesla, and Tesla's fate is closely linked to Musk's actions. 
Tesla's SEC filings state it is highly dependent on the services of Elon Musk and that his departure would disrupt its operations and its business prospects. He claims he does not want to be Tesla's CEO, but that Tesla would die without him, and the board has no succession plan for him. In short, he controls Tesla generally through his managerial supremacy. Plaintiffs also proved Musk's control over the acquisition. Musk raised the acquisition repeatedly to the board despite its request for him to focus on Tesla. He instituted the process by negotiating privately with SolarCity's CEO. He, with Gracias, hand-selected legal counsel without board approval. He co-opted Tesla's management and financial advisors without board knowledge. He reviewed and approved Evercore's presentations before they went to the board. On June 22, 2016, he secured an initial offer for himself and SolarCity, then told the market that it would take something unforeseen to him and the Tesla board to derail their unanimous support for the transaction. Musk also controlled the negotiation process, including the timetable, to ensure the acquisition would be approved before SolarCity had to disclose another quarter of declining operational results and or a breach of the liquidity covenant. Musk had daily check-in calls with management and advisors, which no other director attended, directed Evercore to create its own revised projections rather than wait for the downside case that was requested from SolarCity, and accelerated the pace of due diligence when SolarCity's true financial condition began to be revealed. Musk had undisclosed substantive negotiations with Rive and Kendall, and when the board learned that SolarCity would likely fail if it disclosed its quarterly results without a signed deal, Musk pushed them to sign, even though his feckless directors offered just to buy Salivo assets to serve Musk's vision, and published his master plan part due on Tesla's website. In short, plaintiffs have proven that Musk dominated and controlled the transaction process. The acquisition was not entirely fair. Musk had the burden to prove that the transaction was the product of both fair dealing and fair price. Cinerama v. Technicolor, Delaware 1995. Not even an honest belief that the transaction was entirely fair will be sufficient to establish entire fairness. Rather, the transaction must be objectively fair, independent of the defendant's beliefs. Musk did not meet his burden. There was no fair process. Fair process focuses on the actual conduct of corporate fiduciaries in effecting a transaction, such as its initiation, structure, and negotiation. Fair process embraces questions of when the transaction was timed, how it was initiated, structured, negotiated, disclosed to the directors, and how the approvals of the directors and the stockholders were obtained. One indicium of fair process is whether the terms of a merger were reached through a process that involved procedural protections that would have tended to assure a fair result. The board failed to take any steps to prevent Musk from controlling the process. It did not form a special committee or empower any independent director with authority to negotiate or reject the acquisition. Musk picked Tesla's legal advisor, co-opted its financial advisor, and engaged in negotiations with both the board, e.g. the range of the initial offer, and Solar City. Musk withheld critical information from the board before telling stockholders that the deal was almost certain and necessary for Tesla's strategic vision. Worse yet, Denholm co-signed for Musk's fully recused lie when talking to stockholders and proxy advisory firms at the time of the acquisition, only to testify at trial that she was not surprised or concerned by his behind-the-scenes involvement. Musk's material misrepresentations and omissions also rendered the process unfair and defeat Musk's affirmative defense. First, Musk concealed his true role in the process. Specifically, Musk and Tesla falsely assured stockholders that he was fully recused, but failed to disclose that Musk initiated merger discussions with his cousin without board approval after learning that SolarCity could no longer pay its bills on time without tripping its liquidity covenant, had Tesla's general counsel Marin obtain a waivers conflict from Wilson Sonsini without board approval, selected with Gracias but without board involvement Tesla's legal advisors, Wachtell, discussed the potential acquisition of SolarCity with Evercore prior to Evercore's first board presentation, participated in substantive price and strategy discussions at the board's June 20, 2016 meeting, effectively negotiating Tesla's initial offer up to the 2650 to 2850 range selected, repeatedly negotiated with Rive regarding the timing of the transaction and Tesla potentially providing bridge financing to SolarCity, Proposed to both Rive and Kendall that Tesla acquire Salivo assets from SolarCity without board approval instead of bridge financing. Discussed the initial offer price and other substantive economic terms with Kendall without board approval. Held daily calls with Tesla's advisors and management to accelerate the transaction without board approval. 
Set an aggressive timetable for Tesla management and advisors to complete diligence and execute transaction documents without board approval. Discussed Evercore's valuation analyses, projection revisions, and offer recommendations with Evercore before Evercore discussed these matters with the board. Participated in the board's substantive July 24, 2016 deliberations about the timing of a revised offer relative to SolarCity's poor second quarter earnings and downward guidance revision announcement. And participated in a second undisclosed telephonic board meeting on July 24, 2016 to discuss whether Tesla could just purchase the Solivo assets and achieve Musk's vision, a proposal Musk rejected. Tesla stockholders were entitled to a balanced and truthful recitation of events, not a sanitized version that is materially misleading. Each of these omitted or misrepresented facts was necessary to understand the process through which the board agreed to the acquisition. Second, Musk withheld material information regarding SolarCity's value, financial situation, and liquidity crisis. Trial confirmed the following facts, none of which appeared in the proxy or any SolarCity disclosure. Beginning in the first quarter of 2016, SolarCity's VIE lenders were increasingly concerned with SolarCity's creditworthiness and cutting their commitments to SolarCity. SolarCity management forecast that in fiscal year 2016, it would lose over $200 million in cash after financing activities. SolarCity's lenders had repeatedly downgraded SolarCity's risk rating in 2016. SolarCity was at serious risk of breaching the liquidity covenant throughout 2016. SolarCity avoided breaching the liquidity covenant in 2016 only by curtailing deployments, delaying accounts payable, and withholding payroll for its employees, and took such drastic steps after Musk had to delay the acquisition from May to June. In mid-July, Evercore advised the board that breaching the liquidity covenant would threaten SolarCity's solvency, and that SolarCity would likely breach the covenant by July 30, 2016, i.e. the day before the board executed the merger agreement. As of August 7, 2016, SolarCity owed more than $86 million in overdue accounts payable. Musk's August 2016 solar bond purchase was the only available bridge financing for SolarCity because its banks and other lenders would not loan for their funds, and SolarCity was insolvent at the time of the acquisition, contrary to its public disclosure that it had sufficient cash to meet its obligations as they come due, and as Ian Y later confirmed. This information is material. Given the numerous market suspicions that this transaction was a bailout, this information would alter the total mix of information available to stockholders deciding that question for themselves. Third, Musk made false statements and withheld material information about the solar roof. Musk told stockholders that SolarCity would produce solar roof tiles in volume by 2017, i.e. in fewer than 13 months. Unbeknownst to shareholders, the solar roof was never part of the Tesla board's value proposition for pursuing a transaction. SolarCity had yet to create a working or scalable prototype and had no budget to develop one, and it would take three to four years after development of a working model to achieve volume. Musk admitted this information was material. Musk intended these statements to sway the stockholder vote. Following the product launch, a reasonable stockholder would assume the solar roof was an important part of Tesla's value proposition for pursuing the transaction with SolarCity. In truth, it was not, nor could it have been, given the state of the project. Because material information was withheld from stockholders and the market, Musk cannot rely on the stockholder vote or SolarCity stock price to cleanse his self-dealing and justify the price Tesla paid to acquire SolarCity. Musk failed to prove a fair price. At the conclusion of trial, the court asked the parties to address what factors the court can and cannot consider when evaluating fair price. Fair price relates to the economic and financial considerations of the proposed merger, including all relevant factors, assets, market value, earnings, future prospects, and any other elements that affect the intrinsic or inherent value of a company's stock. American Mining Corp. v. Tarot, Delaware 2012. An unfair process can infect price. When the price is the product of an unfair process, the burden of proving fair terms will be exceptionally difficult unless reliable markets and dependable precedents provide compelling evidence of fairness. Valiant Pharmaceuticals International v. Journey, Delaware Chancery, 2007. A finding of unfair price is appropriate where the acquired company was in financial distress that was not reflected in the optimized projection used to justify the transaction. The market trading price is not an entirely reliable estimate of value when non-public information about the company's value and financial prospects is known to the controlling stockholder. Unfair price is also established by evidence that 
the price paid was within the low end of the range of possible prices that might have been paid in negotiated arm's length deals, but the evidence could not support that defendant's misconduct did not taint the price to the company's disadvantage. And a DCF analysis, based on the company's most contemporaneous financial projections, establishes a value inconsistent with the price paid. Here, Musk did not prove fair price because he did not rebut the strong evidence that 1. SolarCity was insolvent, 2. SolarCity's stock market price did not reflect non-public information and there were no cognizable synergies, and 3. Evercore's fairness opinion was unreliable. Musk did not prove that SolarCity was solvent with a viable business model. A corporation may be insolvent under Delaware law either when its liabilities exceed its assets, the balance sheet test, or when it is unable to pay its debts as they come due, the cash flow test. Musk admitted that Tesla was paying for a high growth company. Instead, Tesla received an insolvent company with a flawed and unsustainable business plan. The unrebutted trial evidence proved balance sheet insolvency. After excluding non-recourse VIE associated debt, and securitized assets that could be used solely to pay VIE investors, SolarCity's total liabilities, $6.27 billion, exceeded its total assets, $4.97 billion, by $1.3 billion. The unrebutted trial evidence also proved balanced cash flow insolvency. SolarCity's current liabilities, payable within 12 months, were approximately $1.1 billion, and current assets, available for use within 12 months, were $684 million which equals a net working capital deficit of $416 million. SolarCity's net working capital and cash position continuously and substantially eroded from 2014 through the acquisition's closing. SolarCity's insolvency problems were identified by Lazard before the acquisition closed and by Tesla's auditors after closing. ENY confirmed that SolarCity as a standalone entity would not have sufficient cash to meet its obligations as they come due. Tesla had to execute an equity confirmation letter agreeing to make capital contributions to SolarCity and pay off outstanding debt. Musk also did not refute evidence that SolarCity's cost structure was unsustainable. SolarCity historically spent more than $2 in operating and equipment costs to generate $1 in revenue. By 2015, SolarCity spent more than $1 in sales and marketing costs alone to produce $1 in revenue. SolarCity's flawed cost structure is summarized below. Musk's expert confirmed SolarCity's business model failure. Van Ziel's analysis demonstrated that SolarCity's cost per watt for solar installations was historically greater than the asset financing SolarCity raised to pay for the installation projects. Van Ziel testified that SolarCity was growing too fast and could not obtain the necessary short-term borrowing to make up for the shortfall. To fix the business model, SolarCity would have needed to stop their growth i.e. stop deploying solar systems, and seek value for long-term residual returns in the short term without destroying equity value. Mossner testified this new business plan was not viable and could not succeed. Indeed, as SolarCity bankers perceived while the process was ongoing, SolarCity was unlikely to overcome its insolvency problem. Bilicek testified, the feedback from the market when we talked to people is that they didn't think this business was financeable. People were worried about the language used by some of the people approached concerns about solvency, viability and liquidity of the company, and financing into a business that was not going to be viable for the long term. Musk did not dispute the insolvency test used by a plaintiff's expert, which have been accepted in this court. He presented no expert to opine that the insolvency tests were inapplicable or that their objective application to SolarCity's financial condition was flawed. Musk's failure to prove solvency precludes a finding of fair price. Musk failed to prove that SolarCity's market price was fair price. Musk's only arguments to justify the price paid were that SolarCity's stock price represented fair value and huge synergies supported the premium. Musk's stock price plus synergy theory fails. First, plaintiffs proved that SolarCity was, facing a severe liquidity crisis and likely to breach its liquidity covenant, deferring accounts payable, delaying public disclosure of reduced guidance of megawatts deployed, and suffering from credit downgrades and a failed credit exam. Musk did not prove the market was aware of this material information. Second, Fischl's $16.16 .16 per share price, $1.6 billion total SolarCity value, under his stock indexing methodology, which this court has rejected, 
it is still $809 million less than the $2.44 billion value of the shares Tesla paid in the acquisition. Musk claimed that this difference can be made up by synergies is illogical on its face as it would assume synergies added 50 plus percent to SolarCity's value with Tesla paying the entire synergy value to SolarCity as a premium unsupported by any market-based evidence and not based on any contemporaneous evidence or expert testimony that there were any cognizable synergies. Musk failed to prove Evercore's valuation justifies the price. Because a financial advisor eager for future business from the controller may compromise its professional valuation standards to achieve the controller's unfair objective, this court rarely relies on fairness opinions as proof of a fair transaction. The record demonstrates that Evercore's fairness opinion is not proof of fairness. Evercore's actions demonstrated that the firm sought to justify SolarCity's price and collect its fee. It played with the DCF methodology and its valuation summary with the unifying theme for these changes of making the asking price look better. Evercore's fairness opinion was focused on finding a way to have the proposed acquisition terms make sense, rather than aggressively testing whether the transaction was a good idea in the first place. It produced an increasingly non-real-world set of analyses that obscured the actual value of what Tesla was getting, pushing SolarCity's value up rather than down. Evercore helped its client rationalize the one strategic option available within the controlled mindset that pervaded the process. Evercore based its fairness opinion on two primary analyses, DCF and some of the parts analyses that used manipulated and unreasonable inputs to increase the value of SolarCity to make the transaction appear fair. Evercore rushed to create the sensitivity case after a call with Musk on July 14, 2016, manipulated the projections repeatedly over the next several days, and increased its DCF range from $15 to $25 to $18 to $28 and then to $25 to $44. The sensitivity case included 25 to 30 percent annual increases in megawatts deployed when SolarCity's performance was trending the opposite direction, forecasted that SolarCity's cash flow would swing from negative $226 million in 2016 to positive $437 million in 2020, an unrealistic $663 million jump in five years, forecasted significant growth in a dying commercial sector that SolarCity expected to abandon, forecasted a steep decline in installation and equipment cost and simultaneous increase in margins that were not supported by the record, failed to account for the negative impact of SolarCity's reduced creditworthiness, and included $1.835 billion, 91.3% of total, of cash flows in the final projected year from the soon-to-expire ITC. Plaintiffs proved significant damages. When the court finds that defendants breach their fiduciary duties, the damages flowing from that breach are to be liberally calculated. The Supreme Court has emphasized the capacious remedial discretion of this court to address inequity. As long as there is a basis for an estimate of damages and the plaintiffs have suffered them, mathematical certainty is not required. The court starts with its best understanding of the fundamental or intrinsic value of the acquired assets, then considers equitable adjustments thereto. However, while fair value is one possible remedy, the court can fashion any form of appropriate, equitable, and monetary relief, including recessory damages. Where a defendant's misconduct has caused evidentiary uncertainty in calculating damages, such ambiguities are construed against the self-conflicted defendant who is not entitled to complain that damages cannot be precisely measured. This court has frequently used its broad remedial powers to craft a proper remedy for the harm done by a fiduciary wrongdoer. In Bull Marco, the court awarded damages of approximately five times the deal price, noting that the law does not require certainty in the award of damages where a wrong has been proven and an injury established. In southern Peru, the court considered the standalone equity values for the acquired business and awarded damages equal to the difference between the price that the special committee should have paid and the consideration actually paid in the transaction. While acknowledging that valuation inevitably involves some speculation, the court awarded over $1.3 billion in compensatory damages. Here, plaintiffs proved entitlement to an equitable remedy based on either 1. Compensatory damages equal to the price Tesla paid, less SolarCity's value, considering both liquidation and going concern scenarios, or 2. An equitable remedy based on principles of restitution, unjust enrichment, rescission, and recessory damages, taking into account the enormous post-closing gain Musk has realized from the acquisition. Compensatory Damages 
an award of compensatory damages remedies proven actual loss caused by the defendant's wrongful conduct. Compensatory damages are equal to the difference between fair or intrinsic value of the target company and the price that was actually paid. Awarding compensatory damages is a flexible process and a significant discretion is given to the court in fashioning an appropriate remedy. The appropriate premise of value for determining a fair price for an insolvent company is liquidation value. Liquidation value is the net amount that would be realized if the business was terminated and the assets are sold piecemeal. Plaintiffs proved that Tesla paid far in excess of SolarCity's liquidation value. Plaintiffs produced a liquidation analysis from a certified distressed business valuation expert who has valued hundreds of financially troubled and insolvent companies during his career. That analysis showed that SolarCity's net liquidation value was a negative $1.952 billion. SolarCity's equity value was therefore worthless as of the closing of the transaction. Musk did not provide a liquidation analysis or refute plaintiff's methods. Where a company is a solvent going concern, the proper approach is to value it using traditional income and market methods. Even if SolarCity were a going concern, traditional valuation methodologies proved substantial damages. Plaintiffs valued SolarCity using a cost approach, which assume it was a going concern. Plaintiff's expert provided two valuations which are highly relevant for financially troubled companies because they do not rely on the riskiness of future operational cash flows as an element of value. First, he performed an adjusted appraised net asset valuation based on the appraised value of assets of the subject company reduced by liabilities and other valuation provisions as of the valuation date. Using values from KPMG's due diligence report, SolarCity's adjusted appraised net asset value was $10.23 per share. Next, plaintiff's expert performed a fair saleable asset valuation, adjusting appraised amounts to replicate the value SolarCity would receive in a transactional arena from a third-party acquirer without applying any discounts for financial distress. This analysis yielded a fair value for SolarCity at $1.59 per share. Again, Musk did not refute plaintiff's inputs, assumptions, or methodologies. Under the income approach, plaintiffs submitted a DCF analysis using the SITC phase-out case prepared by plaintiff's solar industry finance expert. Plaintiff's DCF analysis resulted in a fair value for SolarCity of $6.14 per share. Adjustments to Tesla's sensitivity case reflect scheduled reductions in SITCs in place at the time of the transaction and result in a steady state to SolarCity's cash flows at the end of the forecast period. Musk did not dispute Mosner's adjustments, and Fischel admitted that SITCs should not be included in the terminal period. Plaintiff's DCF analysis used a conservative cost of capital of 13.22% and generous perpetuity growth of 4.0%, matching Evercore's assumptions. Musk did not challenge the reasonableness of either DCF analysis input. Plaintiffs also introduced a guideline public company's GPC analysis, which applied a multiple to SolarCity's revenues. This analysis used Sunrun and Vivant, which were two of the largest U.S. residential solar installers as comparable companies. When applying comparable revenue multiples and deducting SolarCity liabilities, the analysis showed SolarCity's equity was worthless. Musk did not show that Sunrun and Vivant were not comparable nor contest plaintiff's methodology. In sum, regardless of whether SolarCity was insolvent and valued on a liquidation basis or was merely financially distressed and valued as a going concern, plaintiffs have shown a proven actual loss caused by the defendant's wrongful conduct. Thus, under a pure compensatory appraisal measure of damages, plaintiffs proved damages between $1.41 and $2.44 billion. Tessa is entitled to alternative recessory and restitutional relief. This court's power to fashion any form of equitable and monetary relief appropriate for a breach of fiduciary duty includes recessory and restitutional relief. Must disclosure violations, self-dealing, and failure to satisfy entire fairness warrant consideration of recessory and restitutional relief. Compensatory damages would only compensate for Tesla's out-of-pocket loss from the issuance of the excess shares at the time of the acquisition. Out-of-pocket damages measured by the fair values of Tesla and SolarCity stock at the time of transacting, however, are insufficient to address the unjust enrichment and improper gain Musk will realize from retention of his excess shares. Recessory relief should include post-transaction incremental value elements. Recession is the preferable remedy for a fiduciary's improper acquisition of stock. While rescission of the entire acquisition is not feasible, a partial recessory and restitutional remedy against Musk is possible with respect to his excess shares. The Court of Chancery has discretion in the fashioning of recessory relief 
consistent with the equity of the circumstances and conduct of the parties. This court can grant hybrid recessory relief that includes both partial rescission and recessory damages. Rescission can also serve as restitution for unjust enrichment or as an equitable remedy for misrepresentation. Unjust enrichment is a very broad and flexible equity doctrine based on the principle that it is contrary to equity and good conscience for a defendant to retain an improperly received benefit. The court can also award recessory damages based on the change in valuation of wrongly acquired stock and require a disloyal fiduciary to make restitution for unjust enrichment and disgorge improper profits. Moreover, strict imposition of penalties under Delaware law should be imposed to discourage disloyalty. Here, Musk's disloyal conduct caused Tesla to pay excess of shares for an insolvent company. Musk personally received 2,403,024 Tesla shares for his 21,845,674 SolarCity shares. Those Tesla shares were split 5 for 1 in August of 2020. So Musk now owns 12,015,120 Tesla shares as a result of the acquisition. This is far more shares than he should have received if the acquisition had been fair, the excess shares. Tesla also paid Musk $65 million and his cousins $35 million, $100 million in Q1 2017 for early repayment of the bridge loan they gave SolarCity in August of 2016. Tesla also signed the equity confirmation letter in 2017 that ensured SpaceX would be repaid its $165 million of SolarCity debt by Tesla after E&Y concluded SolarCity lacked sufficient cash to pay those debts when they became due. This debt would have been a loss without the acquisition and its repayment by Tesla provided benefits to Musk, his family, and his other enterprises. The court's discretion permits it to take into account that Musk received the excess shares and thus he has greatly profited and has been unjustly enriched. The equities and circumstances here suggest a simple and practical recessory and restitutional remedy. The chart below reflects the excess shares Musk currently owns at their current value. Musk should either return the excess shares to the company or pay recessory damages based on their current market value of the excess shares. Conclusion Plaintiffs request that judgment be entered in their favor and damages and or other equitable relief be awarded based on the court's predicate factual finding. And that is how we are going to wrap up this 12-episode series on the Solar City Bailout Trial. For those of you who have just come across the series, please check out the other 11 episodes we put together, breaking down the testimony from Elon Musk, Kimball the Cook, George Bilicek from Lazard, and the current chair of Tesla, Robin Denholm. A special thank you to all the people who contributed to our GoFundMe campaign toward this series. If you'd like to contribute to future productions, please check out our channel's page on Patreon. The one thing we are going to add to this episode before we sign off is this. The final chart of the post-trial brief gave the breakdown of how Musk should be penalized for his disloyalty and self-enrichment in this bailout. But those values were based on a stock price at the time of submission of 781.31. Now that we're expecting a decision to come down any day, and the award would be based on current stock price, the values depicted will be adjusted accordingly. Tesla shares traded after hours on Thursday at 989.50, so the award for the plaintiffs should be closer to $12 billion in recessory damages and possibly higher if the court decides to act within its available powers to discourage further disloyalty from similarly self-enriched CEOs. Again, thank you for watching and for your support of this channel. It's been a marathon, but we're at the end of it now, just waiting on the verdict. Of course, once the decision comes down, sometime before the end of the month, will be obligated to do a breakdown of that decision. And if it goes the way we expect it will, there will definitely be a celebratory barbecue in our future. Before you leave, please give the episode a thumbs up, share it with your friends on social media, and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.